Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. Three ingredients, an upside surprise on PPI, a downside surprise on jobless claims. Throw in a little bit of hawkish Fed speak and you get a recipe for this. Equity futures down and down hard. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Brazilian economic data keeping bond yields elevated. Tech outperforming this year in the face of higher rates as President Biden and Tesla's Elon Musk make nice. We begin with the big issue, gloomy economic predictions taking a beating. Look at all of the data. The extremely strong data. The U.S. consumer is very strong. The jobs market is still very, very strong. The economic data uh, seems to be more resilient. The market's just waiting for the data to fall apart. Nothing mm -hmm. ever uh, happens in a straight line. That's why we're moving from, you know, hard landing, soft landing, no landing. Growth and inflation are going to be higher than what was expected a month or two ago. If you were in the camp of a Fed pause, you're definitely disappointed. The Fed's going to have to be a little bit more aggressive. This, to me, signals that we're not done yet. Inflation is still too high. It's going to be tough to get inflation down. Jeff Powell essentially selling us their data dependent. Odds of rate cuts for us are off the table for end of this year. The tightening cycle has a little bit more room to go. Mike McKay joins us now for more. Hi, Mike. John, a data dump this morning that really confuses the markets. Uh, it kind of tells us that the economy is stronger and inflation stickier than we have thought, or at least it backs up the data we've already gotten this week on that. PPI for final demand comes in up seven-tenths of a percent. The trade services number, which I'll talk about in just a second, only up two-tenths of a percent, and that's important. Housing starts down four and a half percent, uh, kind of a surprise because the weather was bad in December. It was supposed to be better in January, building permits up only a tenth. But here's the number John was talking about, 194, in terms of jobless claims, still no sign that companies are getting rid of people. And our outlier of the day, the Philadelphia Fed comes in negative 24.3. Employment slipped and new orders slipped and jobs were cut in half in terms of the outlook there. So that is your one sign of strength in the economy or a weakness in the economy overall. Now, the reason I mentioned the trade services, trade services are a combination of the uh, of, of the um, margins for retailers and wholesalers. And normally when margins are going down, you are seeing companies lay people off. And in this case, that's not happening. I'm using the unemployment rate as a proxy for jobless claims because uh, it's hard to do jobless claims with the numbers in 2020. Uh, 2020. But you can see that we're seeing an issue there. Now, uh, you've got this from Loretta Mester that has made a big difference uh, to the markets this morning. Uh, she thinks that they could have gone 50 or should have gone 50 at the February 1st meeting, which puts that into the conversation now for March 22nd. She's not a voter, but uh, people will be talking about, well, are they going to do 50? Because we're seeing these high inflation prints. And the interesting thing about all of this, John, is that if you go back to the Fed uh, dot plot from December, there were uh, the majority at 5%, that 5.1% uh, was what the belief was for 2023 for the Fed funds rate. But there were seven members, only two short of being a majority, who thought they would go above 5%. So basically the market is catching up to the Fed right now. The Fed has been predicting this as a possibility all along. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. A lot to chew over. JP Morgan's Kelsey Barra joins us now alongside BlackRock's Jean Bavan. Kelsey, wonderful to have you with us. Let's start with you and go through this piece by piece. Unemployment at 3.4%. Retail sales just printed 3% yesterday, three handle. Claims just around 200K. Upside surprise on PPI. What do you say to this? Well, the facts are coming in and the facts are telling us that the U.S. economy is more resilient. Um, and so... The, the Fed is highly data dependent at this point. And so when the data comes in stronger than expected, you see these strong market reactions. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing today. Jean Bavan, your thoughts on it as well. Just upside surprise after upside surprise on a hard data. It's pretty impressive stuff. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, we've seen a, a growing disconnect uh, appearing over the last few weeks uh, since January. I think that is now being, uh, being uh, you know, being resolved. Uh, the disconnect was between the Fed and the markets. Uh, that gap is closing, closing quickly. I think the main massive change we've seen was a shift from hopes that inflation would resolve itself in a straight line to 2%. And those hopes have been dashed with like the last two weeks of data, which have made pretty clear that, uh, first of all, inflation didn't fall as much as we thought. Uh, second, uh, you know, it's going to be more persistent uh, than was expected. And third, the labor market is so tight uh, that it's very, very difficult to expect uh, that to resolve on its own. John, you and so I have talked about this right. before. You've said recession foretold. Are you still pushing that recession call in the face of this? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, the key thing here is that the lens on the data, the activity data, uh, has to be, uh, you know, shifting. If you are starting from the point of view that uh, inflation will not fall on its own to 2%, then I believe that strong data on activity coming in is bad news for markets because it's going to mean more hawkish central banks than what they're expecting. Um, and I think they'll have to do more as a result. The stronger we are seeing the, current, the, the near term, the more they will have to do. Uh, the reality is, is the recession might be, uh, you know, farther on the horizon than we would have thought, but I still think we're going to see a very significant, uh, you know, slowdown. You can debate about whether it's recession or not, but it's, uh, it's still uh, more than the market is currently discounting. Well, let's talk about what it means for the Fed. Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed speaking moments ago. Mike McKee touched on that. Here's the quote from her just moments ago. At our meeting two weeks ago, setting aside what financial market participants expected us to do, I saw a compelling economic case for a 50 basis point increase which would have brought the top of the target range to 5%. Kelsey, in your mind right now, based on the incoming information, how far do you think this Fed's going to push it? Well, the Fed has more work to do. Uh, we do expect uh, at least two more 25 basis point uh, rate hikes. And, you know, the, the view on this has evolved, um, and particularly because of the backward revisions to CPI and payrolls, which, you know, we don't, really focus on revisions very much, but they really changed the landscape in terms of how much progress the Fed has made. So they have made progress. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that they have hiked 450 basis points, which is an extremely aggressive pace, especially considering at the beginning of, of 2022, they were actually still doing QE. But at the same time, what the data has shown us is, is a couple things. One, just to put some numbers around it, payrolls has decelerated from around 600,000. Uh, prior to the revisions, it looked like job growth had slowed to around 250,000. Now with the revisions and the new data point, job growth is actually running on a three and six month moving average basis at 350,000. Now look at CPI. Uh, CPI, three month core uh, CPI annualized rate was running around 8%. It came down to around 3%. Now after the revisions, that 3% is more like four, four and a half percent. So if you just look at the landscape right there, uh, the improvement is happening, but it's happening slower than we uh, originally anticipated or originally was shown in the data. And as a result, it's too soon for the Fed to stop hiking, um, at least for now, at least two more rate hikes expected. Kelsey, these are real changes. You've gone through the economic data and so many people who came into this year with a bearish view on the economy has had to recalibrate and change the probabilities around a range of outcomes, a range of scenarios. I want to understand from your perspective just how close we are to being sufficiently restrictive at the Federal Reserve, whether financial conditions are easy or whether they're tight. Because you've been pointing towards the senior loan officers survey, which screams tight conditions. I'd look elsewhere at equities and credit in public markets, and that screams things are easy. Which one is it? Yeah, so this is absolutely the most important question. We know the Fed is getting to at least 5%. So the question is, is a 5% Fed funds rate sufficiently restrictive? Now, of course, it's reasonable to ask that question because the data this month has been incredibly strong. But we're trying to look at the big picture. And there are signals in the market as well as in the economic data that suggest that policy is still becoming significantly restrictive. So I'll point to three. One is the highly inverted yield curve, right? It's telling us that growth is going to be slowing and it's being coupled by low 10 and 30 year inflation break evens. The Fed has credibility um, that they are going to get inflation down no matter what, whatever it takes. The second, this is what Powell's been pointing out, high real yields across the curve 
you look at the tips curve, uh, real yields are at least one and a half percent across the curve. That is uh, a very high level of real yields consistent with tight financial conditions. Now, of course, the financial conditions indices themselves are all based on asset price movements. But what I've been focusing on is that senior loan officer opinion survey, which is not just about asset prices, but it's about credit conditions. And banks are telling us they are tightening credit standards and loan demand is falling. And this has been, over the last 30 years, a highly predictive indicator of rising defaults and slowing real GDP. It's all happening a lot slower than we anticipated but it is still showing up in the data. We do think that when we get to five to five and a half, uh, policy will be sufficiently restrictive enough for them to pause. That last line, though, is so important. It's happening more slowly than we anticipated. Now, John, I understand the need for patience, and you get paid to wait. I've heard all of that. You get 4.6% on a two-year. You get more on T-bills. I get it all. You get paid to wait. Have patience. It's a process. Wait, wait, wait. You came into this year, John, you said recession foretold, you're underweight equities, and then all of a sudden the S&P's up 8% year to date, and the Nasdaq's up 15% year to date. How much longer can you sit that out? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the, this is an environment that the framing, I think, is important. And I think we of this environment. And also to remind people maybe that the horizon we have in mind when we make these calls is like 6 to 12 months. Uh, within this environment that we think is structurally more volatile, uh, there can be periods where, like, you know, there might be very significant trading opportunities, and I think January was clearly one. Uh, we've seen the market going with some hopes of, uh, you know, perfect scenario materializing, and that can run for weeks, as we've seen. And, um, and then, you know, if you can time it, you want to you wanna be long that, that period. Uh, but I think more structurally, more fundamentally, these episodes are more short-lived. I think we're going to see more frequent reversals. Uh, because of the nature of this environment. And I think they are triggered by the fact that the, the central bank is not uh, going to let go or ease up on inflation that easily. Uh, and we're going to get reminded every now and then. And I think we're at that phase now of like the pause, the pause in the rally, this being reassessed. And I think this is in line with this broader kind of environment where we are going to see, you know, period that looks bullish, uh, but they're going to be not the prelude to, uh, you know, quarter-long, decade-long, year-long uh, bull yeah. market, so much more quicker reversals. John, there are these beast disconnects that I think are leading to a lot of people just sitting there scratching their heads trying to figure it out. Futures are down today by 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq we're down by 1.4%. But take a look at what's been happening in the bond market. I know you guys follow it closer than I do. The two-year had a closing low on January 18th of 4.08%. The two-year right now is at 463. That's a 55 basis point move on a two-year over that period. John, if you take a look at tech, the NASDAQ, over the same period, we've had a real rally. We saw it again yesterday. What explains the outperformance in tech this year, John, against the backdrop of everything we've been talking about? Better data, high yield, and a pressure on the Fed to do more. Well, I think the disconnect is, is somewhat broader, right? I think we've seen, uh, you know, a very significant repricing on the rate space. As you've just mentioned, the two years is a key gauge of that. Uh, but if you just look at the policy path, right, we've seen like more than 100 basis points reappearing in the curve over like the, the next two years in terms of policy path. Uh, and moreover, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was impossible to contemplate uh, Fed erring on the side of more than five or 525. And now we have calls that are much higher than that. So, so we're getting more to a two-sided debate on the policy path and a path that is higher. That has been reflected in fixed income. Uh, but the equity side of things, uh, for now is telling a different story. Uh, I don't know if it's based on hopes that is more focused on the activity side of things that is more resilient. But again, I think well, ultimately uh, it's a question about is it the old playbook that we should be applying? The old playbook would be one where if you see strong activity data now, you expect things to be better. Or is it like the new playbook where we're dealing with inflation and stronger activity now means more pain to come after? And I think this is a tug of war between the, you know, the rate market versus the equity market at this juncture, it's a, uh, which I think we'll need to do so. It's a super difficult moment for so many people, Cassie, because you can nail the Fed call. Let's say you came into 2023 and said, I think this date is going to be resilient. I think this Fed's going to have to go further. I think this risk the terminal rate is higher. You nailed it. Great. But then you have to make an equity call a call on risk off the back of that. Maybe you would have said, I don't think tech's going to do well in that world. I don't really like risky credit. The Fed's going to have to do more. We're going to see some demand destruction. And then Kelsey, risk has absolutely ripped. Do you want to stay with some of those moves? 
Yeah, so here's the thing that I, I think is comforting to, to markets more broadly is what caused all of the pain last year was the fact that we went from zero to 450. I mean, that's zero to 100, essentially. It was a massive pivot from the central bank. What we're talking about now are incrementally more hawkish moves, right? So, you know, even if we get an extra 25 or an extra 50 or even an extra 75. This is not the level of pain um, that we're going to observe in the bond market that, that we saw last year just because of the starting point. And, and that's why, you know, we can remain convicted on the idea that fixed income has a place in your portfolio this year. You know, we've been saying to stick high quality. If you look at the investment grade excess returns so far for 2023, they've already nearly recouped all of the losses in excess return terms that they lost in 2022. So being high quality, you know, remaining invested, getting that income has benefited you because the 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 delta on the amount of aggression from the Fed uh, this year versus last year is is very different. That wall of demand of fixed income has been absolutely phenomenal. Kelsey Barrows, John Bavan are going to stick with us. Equity futures right now down a little more than one full percentage point on the S&P. The open and about 15 minutes away. Coming up, China slapping fresh sanctions on U.S. corporates. The PRC's attempts to uh, accuse us uh, of doing the same. It is uh, just more misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it is just not true. That conversation up next. The United States is always going to uh, take responsible, prudent, and appropriate actions to protect our people. That is precisely what this government did in response to the PRC violating our sovereignty, violating international law by sending a high-altitude surveillance balloon. This is not the type of program that the United States uh, is conducting over China. Uh, the PRC's attempts to uh, accuse us uh, of doing the same. It is uh, just more misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it is just not true. U.S.-China tensions running high. Beijing imposing fresh fines and sanctions against two U.S. defense companies. The nation's foreign ministry warning recent events could jeopardize talks between top diplomats in Germany, saying the following. The U.S. cannot ask for communication and dialogue on the one hand, while sharpening differences and escalating crises on the other. Emily joins us now in Washington. Hey, Emily. Hey, John. So this is going to be the next big test for U.S.-China relations coming up later this week at the Munich Security Conference. Does Secretary of State Anthony Blinken take time to meet with China's foreign diplomat Wang Yi on the sidelines of this event? Of course, they were supposed to have that meeting and then that's a, a Chinese balloon flew over the U.S. Then we shot it down and then there has been this back and forth with the U.S. putting Chinese companies on various sanctions lists and now, of course, the sanctions coming out against the subsidy of Raytheon as well as Lockheed Martin. And this just shows tensions are still very high between the two countries. There's still a willingness to work together. Remember, Biden tried to get that underway last November with his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. But of course, some of these recent events have really sort of led to a heightening of tensions. And I think there's a, a big question as far as where the U.S.-China relationship goes after this. Emily, thank you. We'll cover that the Munich Security Conference tomorrow. Looking forward to catching up with Emily and Maria today. I it. That's the bearish view on China, the geopolitics, the relationship between the US and China. The bullish view is China's reopening. And wow, look at Europe benefiting from it. The FTSE in London, all time high. The CAC 40 in Paris, record high early, earlier this morning. Two names that report tomorrow Air France, KLM, and Hermes. Look at these moves year to date. Air France up 36%. Hermes up more than 20, close to 20%, up more than 19 percentage points year to date. Jean Bavan, U.S. equities hasn't worked out. Do you still like the rest of the world? We, uh, we, we as you say, I mean, I know we think the developed equities in general, uh, you know, are, are, are in a position right now where there's the risk is clearly uh, apparent. And I think the last few weeks are showing that. Uh, we, we are looking more broadly and e, the EM uh, landscape uh, in this environment on a relative basis uh, is starting to look a bit more attractive to us when we talk about equities. Um, there's a bit of a, you know, momentum coming from a China powerful restart and the knock-on effect this is having more broadly, I think is, is part of the news 
and the new development we've seen since late last year. So that's part of that thesis and the broader resilience that they've uh, continued to show. So if we're approaching kind of a, you know, a more nuanced phase of monetary policy in DM economies over the next few months, I don't think we're there yet, but this is a story for 2023. Uh, this environment could be uh, relatively more attractive for uh, EM equities in general. So we're warming up a bit more to that space, I guess. But Cassie, John's uh, not relative. alone. A lot of people have been looking at the US and saying it's not going to be the year of the US. They've been wrong. The US has done pretty well. I look abroad, though, EM, China, Europe, all feels like three flavors of the same story. China's reopening, a better growth profile, a more resilient story. Cassie, where are you on those themes right now? Yeah, so we've been leaning into that recovery theme, particularly in Europe. So one of the noticeable things that uh, we saw or observed recently, uh, European high yield has been spreading above U.S. high yield for quite some time. Those spreads have actually recently converged, which essentially reflects that improving growth picture in Europe via tighter spreads. Spreads are tightening even faster than they are in the U.S. high yield market. So so that is something that we've been leaning into, uh, not just because of the China uh, reopening story, but also because undoubtedly uh, this winter has been very kind to Europe. Uh, the warm weather has helped and it's put, uh, it put the continent in a much stronger position for 2023. Big change from what we expected. Kelsey, John, to the both of you, thank you. Some big things we've got to work through. The hard data from the United States yet today. January has shaked up things big time, the January economic data. Futures breaking down by 1.2% on the S&P. We'll see if this sticks. Yields a little bit higher at the front end, much higher at the long end. On a two-year, higher by a basis point or two, close to 4.65. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Richard Bernstein of RB Advisors warning investors this year's speculative rally is based on false hope. More on that around the open and about seven minutes away. Fascinating morning so far, and good morning to you. About 20 seconds away from the opening ballot, but the futures down a little more than 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down about 1.6%. Jobless claims, downside surprise. PPI, upside surprise. Fed speak, Loretta Mestre of the Cleveland Fed. Loretta Mestre saw compelling reasons to go 50 basis points at the last meeting. Equities down and down hard. As your opening bell, switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this on a 10-year higher by four basis points to 384. We are near the highs of the year across the curve on a 10-year at 384. On a two-year at the moment, just short of them up two basis points, close to 465 after coming close to 470 at 469 intraday in yesterday's session. Dollar showing a bit of strength, euro some weakness, back below 106. Seven at 106.71, we're negative two tenths of one percent there, and crude just about holding on. Seventy-eight dollars and sixty cents. We're unchanged on the session. About thirty seconds into this, equities down one point one percent. We'll see if that sticks on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down one point four percent. Bear in mind, we've had tons of outperformance on the Nasdaq so far year to date. Let's get you one name. Cisco moving higher after delivering an upbeat forecast. The CEO, Chuck Robbins, expecting demand to continue, saying this. I don't want to paint a picture that we're immune, but we've been able to see our customers moving forward with their projects. Ed Ludlow has more. Hey, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Shares up around 3%. Anything above 3.5% would be the biggest jump since November. The stock trading at its highest level since around May of 2022. A lot to jump on here. They're bucking the trend of what we're seeing in corporate America. Initially, for the coming quarter, the period ending in April, they see sales rising 11 to 13% almost double what the street was anticipating, they'd say, thinking that they would say sales would grow 6%. Those are the numbers that they just printed. Uh, additionally, for the full year, the guidance was strong as well. We're going to see top line growth of 9 to 10.5% in fiscal 23, and profit will be around $3.73 to $3.78 a share. Around a dozen analysts, John, have raised price targets on Cisco or upgraded their call on the stock. One reason being that basically during the pandemic period, Cisco had a backlog of orders. They kept the new business coming in 
and now they're managing that process very well. There's still a pipeline there. The kind of harder story to quantify is actually Cisco's finding relevance right now. Yes, we know about layoffs. Yes, we know about companies pulling back, but they're handling a lot more data, which makes Cisco's offerings all the more attractive at this time. But really, it's that handling of the order backlog, the, the bullish outlook going forward. And as I said, that stock pushing higher, bucking the trend of the market this Thursday. That stock's up right now by 3.8 percent. Ed, thank you. Different story for Paramount. Weaker advertising revenue of selling gains from its streaming service. For more, here's Katie Greifard. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Of course, we're talking about Paramount, media giant owned CBS and other networks as well. It's taking a dive this morning after, like you said, a reported fourth quarter numbers that missed on both sales and profit, which ties back to that very familiar story advertising of course ad sales for the legacy tv business dragged down results even though the streaming side continued to grow so you add that together shares are down about oh six percent or so this morning even though media overall has been a bright spot in 2023 warner brothers discovery leading the way there it's up over 60 percent or so year to date and even with today's dive paramount is still looking at year-to-date gains of almost 40 percent or so and a lot of those gains, of course are coming from optimism over the streaming business. So let's take a look at the subscribers, what we're actually talking about here, Paramount. It added almost 10 million new subscribers in the fourth quarter alone. That brings its total to 56 million. As you can see, that's still dwarfed by the likes of Amazon and Netflix and even Disney Plus, but the tra trajectory seems to be higher, John. Katie, thank you. That year-to-date board is absolutely Amazing. Katie, thank you. Let's bring that up again if we can. Paramount, year to date, up 36%. Warner up like 57%. Walt Disney up something like 23%, 24% higher. It's just phenomenal year to date gains on some of those names. Not just those names, but the travel names as well. Hyatt posting Peroom revenue forecast well below its competitor Marriott. Those numbers came this morning. Here's Abby with more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Yeah, it's a similar story. We have the travel stocks absolutely on fire this year, of course, because we've had this continued demand, a surprise to many people. A year ago, it was revenge spending, revenge travel after the pandemic. But here we are a year later, and we're still seeing it. So in the case of Marriott, it's so amazing, or excuse me, Hyatt, it was actually at a record high yesterday. Today, as we were just showing, uh, not so much, down about 4% or more, but a very strong strong quarter. They beat adjusted earnings. They put up $2.50. That's a beat by 622%. Revenue is better, net income better by almost 700%. So again, this is the kind of strength that these companies are seeing. On the other hand, a flip side of it, RevPAR, a measure of revenue per room, because during the pandemic there were fewer travelers, we're looking at uneven comps. So they're looking at 10 to 15% RevPAR growth uh, this coming year. However, excuse me, this coming quarter, but when you compare it to a year ago, well, it's going to be a tough comp, so that could be weighing on shares. But let's take a look at another year to date board. Not quite as dazzling as the media board, but here are the gains in the travel sector. Key takeaway is this massive rally. Some of it could have to do with the savings rate dropping, John. Right now, the personal savings rate here in the U.S. around 3.4% off of that pandemic peak of 34%, maybe a lot of that money coming out of bank accounts as folks want to get out there and live going into uh, these hotels, airlines, gambling, all of it. So impressive this year today gains again. Abby, thanks for that. Just the broader market at the moment this morning and five minutes into the session, we're down a little more than 1% on the S&P on the NASDAQ. We're down by 1.4%. Wall Street really struggling to figure out this market. We've had calls for a more aggressive Fed, getting some validation, that's for sure. This year's rally, though, suggesting otherwise. JP Morgan's Marco Kalanovic saying this behavior isn't just fighting the Fed, it's taunting it. Our piece is Richard Bernstein telling investors to fade the move higher. He says this is based on the hope the Fed will soon return cheap and abundant liquidity. It's highly unlikely. The Fed has no intention of being the hero of speculative investments. Richard, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Richard, great to have you with us on the program. Let's start here with this regime. You said rates high for longer. You said sticky inflation. You've nailed those calls. What you've struggled with is the equity leadership, tech. Why is tech outperforming year to date against that? So, John, good morning. I think tech is the epitome of that speculative fervor that's still in the market. You know, um, as you pointed out, um, somebody had said that the, the ultimate fighting of the Fed. Um, speculation requires uh, huge amounts of liquidity cheap and abundant liquidity. And if you think about, you know, 2020 to 2021, we certainly had cheap and abundant liquidity, record amounts of cheap and abundant liquidity. Um, the Fed is now trying to stop that up. But 
you have this hope among speculative investors that we're going back to that previous regime and that inflation will suddenly subside. The Fed can ease. We'll have sub 2 percent inflation and we go right back to that speculative environment. We just think that's very unrealistic, uh, given the economic data, given the Fed. We, we think the whole regime is changing, but yet investors haven't caught on to that yet. So, Richard, I struggle with this. I've always struggled with the idea that there's a room somewhere that exists on trading floors where the bond guys sit and they sit and trade bonds and they know something the equity traders don't know because they sit somewhere else and no one talks to each other. Are we saying the bond market's right and the equity market's wrong? I'm not so sure about that, Jonathan, because if you look, you know, for, if we take away treasuries for a second and we look at credit spreads, credit spreads are very narrow. Uh, given that we're sliding into a profits recession, one would expect that credit spreads would be wider. But credit investors right now are similar to the speculative, the speculative investors, somehow saying this time is different, that you know we're going to have a profit recession, but credit will be fine. Um, that's a little bit hard to figure out. So I'm not sure that bond investors are looking at anything differently than speculative equity investors are. How do you think this reconciles? What do you think will resolve this issue? I think, I think, unfortunately, for a lot of people, it's going to be disappointment yet again. Um, I, I don't understand why people uh, still are, are momentum investors. I think you would have thought that uh, 2021 into 2022 would have washed out the momentum attitude and people would have become more fundamentally based. But clearly, that has not happened. And, and so that sets up what's the downfall for momentum investing is always hanging on too long. That's where you want to perform as a momentum investor, and I think we're going to see that again. So a part of the equity market you have liked, and let's be clear about this, you haven't just hated equities, you just didn't like tech and didn't expect Correct. the leadership to come from the U.S. or from tech, and that's where the outperformance has been. You have liked Europe, and you have liked the rest of the world. So let's go there. Richard, the year-to-date gains in some of these European names is really impressive. I talked about Hermes, the luxury goods maker, Air France, KLM, one of the biggest carriers in Europe. Those year-to-date gains were up like 20 35%. Got record highs in France, record highs in the UK. Do you see reason for that to continue, even against the backdrop where you think tech and US equities could run into trouble? Yeah, so I think, you know, let's look at this from a purely investment point of view for a second. Just kind of get down in the weeds. I hate to do that, but let's do that for a second. The U.S. market is dominated by three sectors. It's dominated by tech, it's dominated by consumer discretionary, and dominated by communications. Those three sectors still make up about 45% of the U.S. market. That is not true in the rest of the world. And what you found in 2022 was that per country performance was directly related to how little exposure the country had to those three sectors. So our attitude is that we just don't like those three sectors. Everything else is fair game. Our attitude is that, that the menu of investment opportunities, whether it's not in those sectors in the United States, whether it's in other countries, whether it's in other industries, the menu of opportunities is extraordinarily broad. It's just that nobody wants to look outside of those three sectors in the United States. So, so John, yes, I, I think there's plenty of opportunities, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in China, whether it's in energy, whether it's in consumer staples, I think the menu of opportunities is, is very, very broad right now. What's clear to me, though, Rich, is, is you're looking for some of the outperformance so far this year today, this so far this year, to run into some trouble. And I'm trying to work out when it indeed does run into trouble, if you are right. How does Europe look in that kind of market? Are we looking for relative outperformance, or do you still expect absolute performance, positive returns against the backdrop where you think the U.S. equity market is going to run into trouble? Yeah, that's a, that's a very fair question. I'm really talking about relative performance. Look, we're in an environment globally, with the exception of China for a second, where central banks are tightening and profits are decelerating. Right In China, you have the opposite. Profits are accelerating and the central bank is easing. But outside of China, that's generally the, the, the way to think about it. In fact, I think it's about 45 or 50 percent of the world's yield curves are now inverted. So we're not looking at what would normally be a great environment for equities overall, right? You'd like to see central banks easing and profits accelerating, not the opposite. So I think we are talking a little bit about relative performance. However, one has to remember that volatility always signals a change in leadership. So if that happens and the, if the global economy is changing, we're starting to see that change of leadership in a bearish environment, that signals that the new bull environment 
will have very different leadership than this tech consumer communications type leadership that everybody wants to have be the leadership. Just thinking about risk reward at the moment though, Richard, here's a challenge for a lot of people. Do I want to play that complicated game of relative outperformance in equities when it's really tricky right now and the incoming information is telling me that a lot of people, their consensus view on this economy in the US may well be wrong when I can just take a six month T-bill, sit on 5% and sit this whole thing out for the rest of this year? Right. Well, well, John, I realize everybody is a perfect market timer and we can we all get back in at the <laughs> uh, perfect moment. I, I, I get that one. But but let's assume for a second for those of us who are maybe not that perfect. I think the relative performance scheme is important because you want to keep a certain equity exposure within your portfolio. Right. Assuming that one's trading for quarters and years and not for days and minutes, that act that that basic equity exposure remains very important. So I think, look, I, I, I think, you know, we all kind of poo-poo relative performance, but I think it's very important in terms of, of longer-term performance to keep some kind of a, a reasonable equity exposure. I'm not looking for perfection. You know that, Richard. Never. <laughs> Richard, thank you, buddy. As always, it's good to catch up. Richard Bernstein there on this market. Equities right now down 1.2% on the S&P. 13 minutes in on the Nasdaq, we're down 1.4%. Coming up, here's a headline for you. President Biden and Elon Musk kind of reconciling. Tesla has dominated the EV market. It still does. It still will. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, an exclusive interview with General Motors chair and CEO Mary Barra. That conversation at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The price of electric vehicles, uh, it, at one point it was uh, the average price in our calculations was about $66,000. Um, that's more than the household income for most Americans. So um, we are seeing that come down a bit, some of that because of Tesla's moves, but also because we are seeing automakers start to introduce uh, less expensive ones. Tesla has dominated the EV market. It still does. It still will. President Biden offering rare praise for Tesla's CEO, writing in a tweet the following. Elon Musk will open a big part of Tesla's charging network up to all drivers. That's a big deal. It'll make a big difference. The move, making Tesla eligible for funding as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's governments. Jack Fitzpatrick in D.C., Ed Ludlow on the West Coast again. Jack, first to you. Are we making friends here? Uh, it hasn't exactly been a romance between Biden and Musk. This is an interesting little detente because there had been times when Biden wanted to talk about electric vehicles and had kind of made a point of excluding Tesla. There was an event with Ford and GM uh, that they weren't invited to. Uh, I don't know that it's going to be an absolute thawing of that relationship. Some of the Twitter politics has gotten between them. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if it has become, a, 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 I guess, brotherly love between these two. Uh, but it is a notable thing uh, that has connected Musk and Tesla to some of the money available under the infrastructure bill that was enacted last year. Ed, what do you make of this? Yeah, look, it's important for the broader push to, to electrify. The pledge from Tesla is 7,500 chargers split across 3,500 uh, super fast chargers and around 4,000 uh, more sort of standard installations. Um, you know, I, I think back to July of 2021, John, and I think about the stock. I think about Tesla. Goldman Sachs in July of 2021 published research that said if Tesla ever did this, they could realize annual revenues, additional annual revenues of $25 billion. And that's been the frustration with Tesla, that actually if they opened it up, their brand and their kind of incumbency in this market, that would give them another lever, right? Even if people aren't buying their vehicles, it's another service that they can offer. Um, but just like Jack, I don't necessarily think this is a full-on detente. Um, you know, Musk feel, has felt pretty aggrieved in the past. But for the broader initiative to expand charging infrastructure, it's important. But Tesla's still a number two player in this country. Don't forget ChargePoint, which we talk about less, has many more chargers across North America. And I've always thought it was bizarre that this administration didn't include Tesla in more conversations, yeah. including Elon Musk. Elon Musk has talked about it. We've all said the same thing. It doesn't look right. But, Ed, what it seemed to come down to was union workers, which this president just keeps going on and on and on about. Yes. And can you tell me what's the latest on that front with Tesla? 
Yeah, so uh, overnight, uh, according to a complaint filed by the workers at a Buffalo, New York plant, uh, some individuals have been terminated in the last 24 hours or so, having uh, initiated an effort to organize a union effort on Tuesday in the same plant. This effort relates to a small group of employees um, who are autopilot data labelers at the Buffalo facility. In total, there's 800 people on that team. Um, and, you know, they were basically pushing through uh, an affiliate of the services employees union to, to do this. Um, there's been no response from Tesla. But, you know, all we have to go on is this complaint that's been filed that says following that effort to, to organize, following actions that they took on Tuesday, February 14th, handing out leaflets to their colleagues in that plant, some of them have been dismissed. Jack, is that where there's daylight between the president and Elon Musk over this issue? That's where there's a big portion of the daylight. Uh, there are some other areas. Uh, again, the interest in social media and, and Twitter, I think, has gotten between them. There was an instance in which the president said it might be worth looking at his connection to foreign investors. Uh, they have political differences. Um, they, you know, you even look at recently the uh, decision by Musk to go visit Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he also happened to essentially bump into Hakeem Jeffries. Really, they have political differences, and it gets into uh, the union stuff, some of the foreign investment, uh, and even social media. That's, I think there are a few issues like that that get between those two personalities. Uh, but there is a clear bridge between them in the president's interest in investing in electric vehicles and the related infrastructure. And I want to give you the final word. It doesn't sure. seem to make the slightest bit of difference for the stock this year, at least, year to day of 73%. Yeah, I think we're under a little bit of pressure in this session. I think that has a lot to do with the broader market and Fed comments. But, you know, Tesla has revived its fortunes. It's shown that it can use price cuts as a lever to initiate demand. And I think that actually the street was relatively bullish on its last earnings print for this year. All eyes on March 1 Investor Day, where we get the kind of next 10 years worth of planning. But, you know, Tesla has momentum, still trades at a pretty high multiple, though, John. What a year to date rally. Ed, thank you. Ed Ludlow on the West Coast. Jack Fitzpatrick. Down in DC. Your equity market more broadly, 22 minutes in, we're down 1% on the SP and the NASDAQ, down 1.2%. Let's lift the lid on some of these indexes and get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, not surprisingly, with that decline for the SP 500, the worst day of the month, we are looking at eight of the 11 SP 500 sectors trading to the downside. What's so interesting is this expectation that the Fed is going to continue have to lift more than what had been thought just a couple of weeks ago. That is shaping the sector uh, positioning because we have real estate and utilities, those are the worst two sectors, both down 1.6 percent or more. That has to do with the fact uh, that their dividends look less attractive when yields go higher and the expectation that they may go higher yet. On the year, if you want a year to date board, John, let's check this out because the crypto space, it really even puts media and travel to shame. Take a look at the Bloomberg uh, Galaxy Crypto Index up 49%. Coinbase up 85%. Uh, Marathon Digital Riot, pla pla Riot pl uh, Platforms also up in a big way. A double having to do really with this risk on mood and uh, folks really moving to momentum. Abby, thank you. It's truly impressive. Richard Bernstein was talking about it 20 minutes ago. Can this continue against the backdrop of higher interest rates and higher yields? 367, 467 almost right now on a two year. Coming up, your trading diary. Twenty six minutes in, almost yields up, stocks down by one percent on the SP, down by one point two percent to be precise on the Nasdaq, down by one point two five percent. How much of this will get bought through the rest of the session? Look out for that. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. Coming up, DoorDash, DraftKings reporting results after the closing bell. Fed speed continues. Bullard, Cook, Mester all on deck this afternoon. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Fed Governor Bowman speaking on Friday. And finally, the Munich Security Conference kicking off tomorrow in Germany. We'll catch up with Maria Tadeo going into the weekend. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. And as always, good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg TV.